Hello and welcome to our video lecture on polynomial functions and their graphs. We've actually already seen uh, one type of uh, a polynomial function uh, which we refer to as um, the class of linear functions and uh, in general any function composed of uh, terms of the form ax to the n where a is a real number and n is a whole number is called a polynomial function now remember the whole numbers uh, include 0 1 2 3 etc okay so uh, we do not want this exponent here to be negative all right and we also of course uh, don't want it to be fractional or irrational we want them to be very well behaved these whole numbers are the only allowable types of numbers for the exponent here uh, so the general polynomial function will look like something of, uh, like this we usually put it in a, in a descending order from the highest power to the lowest power and um, basically we have a n x to the n then here we're just using uh, subscripts to indicate these are just different coefficients because remember each of these uh, items has a name this is called the coefficient of this term that's the base and in this context we call n the degree normally we refer to that as a, an exponent but in the context of a polynomial we also refer to it as a degree um, so um, notice that the degree is going from n to n minus 1 to n minus 2 in other words it's going down um, by one in each step and of course some of these terms may be missing because the coefficient may be zero but this is the general form of a polynomial function now we'll look at some specific ones uh, that uh, serve as reference functions for their particular degree so the fir first function we want to look at is just a simple function f of x equals x of course uh, you should recognize this as a linear function but it's also a polynomial function because it satisfies the definition so a linear function is a special kind of a polynomial function so to graph it uh, as we have discussed uh, previously we will go ahead and replace f of x with y so we just graph y equals x and uh, as we know that's going to be a very nice simple graph because uh, for each point on this graph the x and y values are the same so when x is negative 2 what's y going to be well y is equal to x so it's also going to be negative 2 negative 1 negative 1 0 0 etc now here we're just using some simple numbers but we don't have any such restriction in other words we could have used negative 1 half we could have used pi we could have used square root of 2 but we just choose these because they're a little bit easier to work with uh, so um, notice that if we just plot those points and of course we didn't need all of those points but it was just for demonstration notice we end up with a straight line that will go through them so um, the domain of course of uh, any linear function whose graph is uh, an oblique line is uh, going to be all real numbers because if you trace back each point to its input and output eventually by looking at all the points on this line you'll notice that the entire x-axis will serve as a the set of all inputs and the set of y-axis in turn will uh, serve as the set of all the outputs of this function so both the domain and range are the entire set of real numbers which we can write like that or we can actually just call r as well so same with the range now 
these look identical in these two forms, but if I were to write this in set builder notation, they would look a little bit different because for the domain, I'm going to say it's the set of all X such that X belongs to the set of real numbers, right? But for the range, we'll say it's the set of all Y such that Y belongs to the set of real numbers, okay? So this is interval notation, set builder notation. All right, so there's our first. This uh, particular uh, line is kind of a famous line. Notice that it takes a 90 degree angle and cuts it exactly in two. So this angle in here will be 45 degrees. So sometimes it's referred to as the 45 degree line. Now, if you remember our discussion of slopes, notice this can be y equals 1x plus 0, right? Because of that 0, we know it goes through the origin when the y-intercept is a 0, 0, because this is b, which is the y-coordinate of the y-interest. So anytime c, I mean, uh, the b value here is uh, 0, then we know that the line is going to go through the origin. And the one here indicates that the slope is one. So this is a kind of a reference slope. So when we want to talk about um, a line being steeper or less steep, we're talking about relative to this line, okay? Now we have a version for the descending lines or the decreasing lines, and that's the slope negative one. So that one will look just like this, right? It'll just be a reflection across the y-axis. So it's a very simple function, but a very important function. Next, we're going to take a look at uh, f of x equals x squared. So again, we're going to go ahead and make a table of values and uh, plot them to get an idea of what this graph is going to look like. Well, we can see it here, but this is how we obtained it because basically if we just plug in a few um, different x values and calculate the corresponding y or f of x values, remember we replaced the f of x with y in order to be able to graph this. And um, So for example, when x is negative two, we're going to get y equals the square of negative two, which is of course four, etc. So when it's negative one, we get one. When it's zero, we get zero squared, which is zero. One will give us one again. Two will give us four. You can see a kind of symmetry here. And again, you can see that symmetry reflected here as well. That's not accidental. These kinds of graphs this is a second degree or quadratic uh, function. Uh, it's a type of polynomial function. And uh, notice that um, when we graph it, because of the fact that, that the highest degree in it is no longer one, you can see it curves, right? So it's not going to be a straight line anymore. The only uh, kinds of, uh, quadratic, uh, I mean, the only kinds of polynomial functions uh, that have a straight line as their graphs are the ones that were the highest degree of the variable in, in the whole expression is one. The graphs of these um, second degree or quadratic um, functions are called parabolas. So just like that, parabola. And these parabolas always have this type of symmetry uh, that we observe here. Now, as far as the domain or the set of x values that actually basically generate this graph, notice that all x values are in play because you can plug in any x value you want in here and you'll get an output. But notice that, so in other words, the domain is all reals. But notice the same is not true about the range. We don't get outputs 
all across the y-axis, right? All our outputs or y-values for this graph are going to start here and go up, right? So we don't have any outputs down here, right? Below the x-axis. So the range or the set of all the outputs of this function is actually just going to be bracket zero to infinity. And if you were to write that in set builder notation, that would be all y such that y is greater than or equal to zero. This one is, of course, is the set of all x such that x belongs to r in set builder notation. All right, so there's a graph of the quadratic or second degree function. We're going to be studying these uh, parabolas in much greater detail later in the course, but this will suffice for now as far as a quick introduction to them. Next, we want to take a look at what's called the cubic function. For obvious reasons, because it is the function whose definition is just simply x cubed, right? So when we pick a few x values and plug them in to uh, the expression here, x cubed, notice when x is negative 2, we're going to get the cube of negative 2, which is of course negative 8. Negative 1 cubed is just negative 1. 0 cubed is just 0. 1 cubed is 1. And 2 cubed is 8. So if we plot those patiently and then connect them, we get a graph looking like that, okay? Notice that um, this one uh, does also curve like the square uh, graph, the x squared graph, but this one uh, doesn't bend up like that. So this one does take uh, x values from the entire x axis and for outputs, it does have outputs all across the y-axis as well. In other words, if you pick points here, you'll have outputs that are coming from here. The output for a point like right here comes from here. So in other words, if you were to get into that uh, space shuttle of yours and you have infinite time and from each point, you shoot an arrow toward the y-axis and one toward the x-axis, you can see the input and the output pairs for this entire function. And if you did that for all points, you would eventually see all the y-axis painted and you'll also see the entire x-axis painted. So um, this is why the domain and range for both uh, uh, are both uh, the set of real numbers, not for both, we mean are both. All right. Uh, again, of course, in set builder notation, they'll look at slightly different because this is all x such that x belongs to r. But this one is all y such that y belongs to r. Basically, the outputs are the y va uh, depicted using the y values and the inputs using the x values. Each of these basically points uh, is an input output pair. You put in two into this function, what comes out? In other words, what is f of two? Well, it's two cubed, so it's eight. So when the input is two, the output is eight, like that. So again, each of these is an input output pair. So here we have the fourth degree uh, function, the basic fourth degree function. These can get much more complex, of course. We can have x to the four plus three x cube, etc. So we can have all the other uh, powers as well. But remember, this lesson is just an introduction to the basic polynomial functions, right? The reference polynomial functions for each degree. So again, we'll go ahead and pick some x values, right? And we, and of course, we could have picked negative 2000, etc. We could have picked any x value we wanted. The only point is, 
uh, why should we do that when we can pick the just simple real nice simple numbers as well right so uh, we want to keep it simple and also notice this particular point will be missed if we were to pick x values that are very large we'll learn later on how to actually find that point etc but for now let it suffice to say that uh, those are good uh, sample points uh, again uh, we plug in negative 2 into this um, expression and of course we get in other words we find f of negative 2 which we know is going to be quantity negative 2 to the power of 4 which is of course positive 16 okay negative 1 will give us 1 0 will give us 0 1 1 2 16 does that look familiar that's very much like the graph of x squared but notice it's a little bit flattened out near this uh, lowest point um, for x to the 4 and uh, this is typical if i go to even a higher uh, even power like x to the 6 that'll even flatten flatten out even more in this region right all right but nevertheless notice domain very similar to x squared is going to be all reals the range again very similar to the graph of f of x equals x squared is going to be all non-negative real numbers so bracket zero comma infinity again in set builder notation that's all x such that x belongs to r in other words all real numbers this one is all x such that x is greater than or equal to zero all right the moment we put that inequality there that that means we're talking about real numbers remember you can only compare real numbers using these symbols uh, inequality symbols uh, and uh, not any number that is not real so as soon as you do that there's no longer a need to say all x such that x is real and x is greater than or equal to zero this is sufficient because as soon as somebody sees that they know oh okay you're talking about real numbers all right do make sure that you're making these tables on your own uh, as we proceed and then also doing the kind of a rough plot with your hand there's nothing that replaces actually doing these for yourself because they give you a real uh, intuition into how this process works so you've probably noticed the pattern by now notice that when you have the odd powers of x they're going to look like this whether it's just x to the one or x cube uh, here in uh, blue or x to the five you see they have the same general shape right uh, except that uh, of course at, as the uh, odd numbers get larger it becomes flatter and flatter close to zero um, with x to the with with the even powers of x notice a similar thing happens they're all very similar but notice the difference is that the higher the power the flatter it gets real close to zero and to understand why that is so if you just plot some points uh, you will see uh, why this is happening because these numbers between 0 and 1 are very special or between negative 1 and 0 uh, with these when you raise the power right you're actually going to get the output to be smaller but remember that's only for numbers between 0 and 1 after that uh, things behave as you would expect right the higher powers are going to have higher uh, values right but not in this region in this region it's the very opposite these numbers between 0 and 1 are real interesting characters uh, let's take a look at a few examples let's say we take the input 1 half which is simple enough right here and let's see what happens to the outputs for each of these functions notice if I take 1 half or 0.5 I'm going to use the decimal equivalent because it'll be easier to compare decimal numbers uh, than fractions with fractions you have to make sure fractions have the same denominator before comparing them and rather than spending time on that we can just use decimals like that 
So now let's look at point five, the output on the very first red function, the square function, right? So we're just going to um, take point five and square it. So we get 0.25. Now, let's go ahead and raise it to the power of four. And what we're claiming is that it's actually going to be a smaller number than that, right? So we take 0.5 and you raise it to the power of four. See, a much smaller, right, number. Now, if you keep going to the higher powers, so let's take 0.5 and raise it to the power of um, 6. Notice, let me just ask if I can copy that. Yeah, that's nice. We'll just change that to 8 now. And see, they keep getting smaller. That's why these curves are getting flatter and flatter, but notice only between zero and one, because what's happening with one half, where each higher power is actually getting a smaller value, is going to happen to all numbers between zero and one, as well as between negative one and zero, right? Uh, if I change all those 0.5s to negative 0.5s, not, notice nothing would change, because, when, because we're raising to an even power, right? So same business would happen on this side also. Now, however, let's pick a number greater than one or less than negative one. So we'll just do the positive case for simplicity because the negative is going to be the same result. So let's just take a number like two. So we don't have to, we could take 1.01 .01 and it'll still be uh, working out the same way, but two is a little bit easier to see. So. If we take two and square it, of course we know we get four, right? Now take two and raise it to the power of four. You get 16. Take two, raise it to the power of six. Of course, you get 64. Notice right after the zero one region is passed, then the ones with the higher powers take off. All right. So they're a little bit slow starters, right? They're kind of like um, cars with really large cylinders, right? Uh, and they're very heavy. And, um, you know, in a short distance, a lighter car might take them over. But you get them on the freeway, right? <laughs> Where they can go ahead and just let it fly. Then sh the power is going to show and they'll take over real quickly. But right after this region in here, okay? So a very, very special region, the numbers between zero and one. They behave differently from all the numbers to the right of one and all the numbers to the left of negative one. Notice that all of these also have the same kind of domain and range, the domain being all real numbers and the range being all real numbers. And all of these even powers behave similarly as well. The domain is all real numbers. The range is all non-negative real numbers. So from zero to infinity. Next, we want to look at what's called transformations of functions. Transformations of functions have to do with taking a function's, um, you know, graph and uh, applying certain uh, types of changes to it and uh, seeing what uh, the outcome will look like relative to the original function. Now, there are three main types of transformations of functions. The first one is uh, called translations. A translation is a change in position of the graph of a function as a result of an addition or subtraction at either the input level x or x level or the output level. Um, translations can move a graph either up, down, left or right, but they don't change the shape of the graph. 
Dilations, on the other hand, do change the shape of a graph. They're a, uh, either a stretching or a shrinking. Uh, it's interesting that uh, dilation could, uh, you know, correspond to a shrinking, but yes, it's a general term, right? That can be used for uh, both of those uh, events. Uh, and these are going to happen about an axis and it's as a result of multiplication or division again either at the input level which is the x level or at the output level we're going to see examples of all this in a minute and they'll make more sense the last kind of uh, transformation is a reflection a reflection is basically a mirror image of a graph of a function across a, a line of reflection uh, and it's caused by a multiplication by negative one either at the input level or the x level or the output level which is the y level um, and um, again reflections are more like translations in the sense that they don't change the sh basic shape of the graph of a function so for all of these uh, examples we're going to look we're going to assume that we know the graph of a given function f and uh, we take a real number k which is positive and we're going to do various uh, things with k and the function and see the outcome right for example the first thing is uh, vertical translations right so if we take uh, if we know the graph of f of x and we just take the f of x and add a k to it that's just going to shift the graph of f of x k units up see and that's a translation notice the shape of the graph doesn't change at all all you do is you imagine that this graph is made up of wire right you're just picking up that metal graph and moving it up two units that's all you're doing for example for this uh, depicted example here um, which is i believe x cube right um, if you did f of x minus k that would just take the graph the original graph here in red and it would move it down k units in this case k is two so uh, the name of uh, the first one is of course an upward uh, vertical shift the category is translation we call these translations uh, as a group uh, this one is a downward vertical shift and again the category is translation so when you take f of x and just add k to it you shift the graph of f of x upward k units when you take f of x and subtract k from it you shift the graph of f of x downward k units we can also do horizontal translations Notice that for vertical translations, the change occurred at the y level and uh, f of x level, but the change for horizontal translations is going to happen at the x level. So what we do is instead of changing, uh, in the, like in the previous case, we did f of x plus k and f of x minus k, right? Notice we're bringing the change to entire the entire f of x or y, right? But in this one, notice we, we're changing x to x minus k. All right, so when this happens, we um, actually shift or... Um, translate this gr the graph of the original function f k units to the right notice when it's x minus k it's actually a movement to the right when it's plus k it's actually going to be moved to the left one way of thinking about this is this that whatever happens to f of x happens to f of x minus k k units later so whatever is happening to this graph is going to happen to the blue graph but it's just going to have happen two units later right whereas for this one a good way of thinking about it is that whatever is happening to the red graph is going to happen to the 
blue graph, which is f of x plus 2, 2 units earlier. Okay? That's one way. So when you see f of x minus k, you're going to shift the graph of f of x k units to the right. When you do f of x plus k, you shift the graph of f of x k units to the left. Again, this one is called the rightward uh, horizontal shift. The general category is translation, again, because you're just moving without changing the shape. Uh, this one is a leftward horizontal shift, and again, the general category is translation. Dilations uh, are a little bit more um, involved, a little bit less uh, intuitive in the sense of harder to see, but, but once you you know get comfortable with them then you'll be able to see them as comfortably as you did uh, translations but it just gets a little bit of getting used to uh, for example if you have um, k times f of x notice that that's going to take the graph of f of x and it's going to actually vertically stretch it by a factor of two right so if you have the point, for example, 1, 1 on the red graph. You're going to have the point 1, 2 on the blue graph, which is the stretched graph, right? However, one interesting to note is the fact that a vertical stretch of a graph results in a simultaneous horizontal contraction you see or shrinking and that's always going to be the case because of just the nature of the way this is happening because this is going to get stretched but at the same time you're going to have a contraction in the horizontal direction all right so the general category here is dilation so when you see k times f of x as long as k is greater than one you're going to vertically stretch the graph of uh, f by a factor of k if the constant happens to be between zero and one such as one half times f of x then you just obviously all the y values are going to get halved so therefore this is going to be a vertical contraction right or um, compression but remember that's going to translate into what look what's happened what how does the blue curve look compared to the red one it's um, horizontally stretched out right and again a vertical contraction or shrinking is always going to be associated with a horizontal um, um, dilation okay now for the horizontal dilations again we're going to bring the um, change at the input level so we're going to multiply k inside the parentheses for the last page the ones we did on the last uh, page notice the k is multiplied by the f of x itself right but for the horizontal dilations, we multiply the k by the input, all right? Not by the output f of x. All right, so these actually work a little bit uh, differently because when you're dealing with a horizontal uh, dilation, when the constant is between zero and one, you actually end up getting a horizontal stretch uh, and when it's greater than one that's when you get a horizontal shrink uh, shrinkage now take a look at this for example here's f of x and here's f of one half x notice that you're going to have a uh, horizontal dilation here or stretch right and of course notice it's always coupled with a simultaneous vertical contraction see or um, compression see notice vertically it this is getting compressed 
but horizontally it's getting wider. And of course the exact uh, opposite happens here when k is between, if I mean, k is greater than one, it actually uh, ends up, your graph actually ends up getting narrower like this, right? So the, there's a horizontal contraction, but notice if you look at what's happening vertically, that's going to be a stretch. So always horizontal contractions go with simultaneous vertical dilations. All right, the last group are actually probably the easiest kinds of transformations. This is when you have the graph of f of x and you just multiply it by a negative one. So that's just going to take the graph of the original function and flip it, right? That's all it's going to do. So that's why um, you get this mirror image across the x-axis. Um, so we reflect the graph of f of x across the x-axis. When we, this happens, it's called the vertical reflection. And again, the category is also just reflection. Uh, when we do f of negative x, when the negative is getting multiplied by the input rather than by, by the output f of x, the reflection is going to happen, but it's not going to happen uh, vertically. It's going to happen horizontally. We call this a horizontal reflection. Notice the red is the original f of x. The blue is f of negative x. So it just gets, uh, you get the mirror image, but not across the x-axis, this time across the y-axis. And that's basically it, that those are all the major uh, types of transformations we're going to be trying out. So let's try those on an actual function. So here we have the graph of f of x equals x squared. We've seen this before. What would you need to do to the graph of f of x equals x squared to obtain the graph of this function? 3 times x minus 2 squared minus 2. All right, so we know that because the x has turned into x minus 2, we're going to be, we know there's going to be a horizontal um, shift. And because it's minus, remember, that's actually going to be a shift to the right. So we can say start... with the graph of f of x equals x squared, then move it to the right, to the e, two units to the right, And then um, notice that there's a three that's being multiplied by it. So, and that's going to be uh, corresponding to a vertical stretch by a factor of three. So move it two units to the right, vertically stretch it. by a factor of three. And finally, we're just going to move it down. That's going to be a vertical shift, downward vertical shift. So, and then finally, move it down to units. All right, so go ahead and see if you can get a rough sketch of this trans all these transformations that are happening uh, together right so we're doing more than one kind of transformation now and see what kind of a graph you look at uh, you, you'll come up with and then we'll compare our answers so go ahead and pause try that and come back all right so notice that here we have the original graph here i drew it in red and um let me go to the same color that we've been using red and blue so 
we have the original graph y equals x squared the reference graph we should say um, in red and remember the moves that we're going to make let's take a look at it again we're going to move two units to the right vertically stretch by a factor of three and then move down two units so notice it has been moved two units to the right then it's been notice it's been stretched vertically by a factor of three and then also moved down two units now uh, at this time we don't have the skills to get a super accurate graph of these later we will but for now i just want you to have a good idea of these transformations the the, the point is not a super accurate graph of a parabola at this point in the term but rather understanding these transformations for the next example i actually wanted you to see that all these rules we just learned with these transformations are not limited to polynomial functions in fact here is a special function it's called the absolute value function uh, so it's not a polynomial function but you'll see that uh, the transformations will work on it just as uh, beautifully as they did with polynomial functions so here we're given the graph of f of x equals absolute value of x this is not difficult to obtain you can just quickly make a table of values uh, such as this so for example when x is negative 2 y is going to be the absolute value of negative 2 which is 2 when it's negative 1 you're going to get the absolute value of negative 1 which is 1 when it's 0 you're going to get absolute value of 0 which is 0 when it's 1 you're going to get the absolute value of 1 which is 1 2 will give you 2 etc notice that's why you get all these points so negative 2 2 negative 1 1 0 0 1 1 2 2 etc so you can see why it looks like that notice that it's kind of like taking the graph of y equals x and kind of shifting this part to the left up because that's what absolute values do they take any negative outputs and turn them into positive right so um, well in this case negative inputs right because you have negative 2 the absolute value is going to turn it into positive whereas if you're just looking at y equals x that's not going to happen you're just going to have negative 2 negative 2 negative 1 negative 1 etc but because of the absolute value all these negative inputs are going to have positive outputs all right so we know where that comes from now now we want to know more importantly how would you get the graph of this function if you know the graph of this reference function I want you to pause the video think about the kinds of moves that would be needed and then come back and we'll compare our answers all right so notice that absolute value of x has changed to absolute value of x minus 3 so we know that's going to correspond to a so we start with the graph of absolute value of x and so start you know just like we did in the last problem so i'm just going to leave that blank you know what i'm referring to here start with the graph of f of x equals absolute value of x then do what well we're going to move it it's x minus 3 so again that's going to be 3 units to the right if it were x plus 3 we would move it 3 units to the left right uh, notice that there's a negative here so that means a reflection if you recall so uh, we're going to reflect it uh, 
vertically and also there's a plus two at the end so we're going to go ahead and move what we have at this point up two units So again, you're considering this to be made of some kind of a movable item, like a piece of wire or something. And then you're just giving instructions for what to do with that to get the graph of this, okay? So, so remember, move it three units to the right, reflect it vertically, and then move it two units up. So go ahead and see if you can do that. Just a rough sketch of this on a Cartesian coordinate plane and then come back we'll compare your answer with the correct one all right so you can see um, the original graph absolute value of x here in red and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to move it three units to the right notice one two three and uh, we're going to reflect it with respect to the x-axis and also so at that point it'll be like here right in fact I can show you at that point where it will be exactly because it'll be right there okay so this is when we've taken it three units to the right and reflected it with respect to the x-axis vertically reflected it and now we're going to move it because of the plus two we're going to move it two units up and eventually we'll find we'll end up with that blue graph so this was an intermediate one we don't really need it so this is where you start this is where you end up because of the transformations that are involved so very simple but very important make sure you understand these transformations well because they apply to all functions all right so here's the last problem of the day a friend tells you that they're in possession of the graph of a function f tell your friend how to obtain the graph of this other function which uses the function f so go ahead and see if you can tell your friend uh, how to move the graph of f to get the graph of this function and that's it that'll be the last thing you'll have to do for this video all right welcome back so let's start with f of 3x right so we start with f of x now we're doing f of 3x so that means we're going to need to do some uh, kind of a horizontal either stretch or a dilation think about which one that would be all right i i wanted to remind you of these um, rules notice that when you do uh, when you have the graph of x to get the graph of f of x uh, f of kx if k is greater than one notice here three is greater than one you're going to be horizontally shrinking it actually uh, by a factor of a three so let's go ahead and start by listing that so start with the graph of f then so we're going to horizontally shrink it or compress it that might be a more professional term to use um, it by a factor of three um, we notice that there is a one half here that's being multiplied by the function so that brings us to this kind of transformation when you have a value between 0 and 1 that gets multiplied by the output f of x we know that that's going to be a vertical shrinkage so we're going to also vertically shrink it 
by a factor of one half. Notice the negative here. That means we're going to be doing a reflection as well. So we're going to then reflect across the x-axis. This kind of a um, transformation. And finally, the easiest part, you're just going to pull it seven units down. So that's just going to be a downward uh, vertical shift. So, and then move it seven units down. All right. And then by the time your friend does that, they will have uh, the graph of the function that they are interested in. Again, um, very, very universal, very useful. So make sure you learn them well. And that should do it for this video. So stay safe till our next one.